that you were forsaken, I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me, because you died and rose again. I'm forgiven, because you were forsaken. Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto all of you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text for this morning's sermon is the Gospel lesson, which is part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. First of all, let me tell you how pleased I am to be here. I am John Tape, the director of the Lutheran Student Center at Wichita State University. Pastor Harmon asked me if I could be here today to fill in for him, and I immediately accepted because it is always a pleasure to join you for worship and to lead you in Bible study. So I thank you for your kind invitation to be here, and I pray that God will bless our time together. Perhaps you've noticed that the gospel reading for today and for last week were two different portions of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. This sermon of Jesus was preached outdoors on a hillside in Galilee, and it is beloved by many people and certainly well worth our consideration. In the portion of Jesus' sermon, which is our gospel lesson for today, Jesus says, I say unto you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you. Well, those are 
beautiful words, to be sure. They're really nice sentiments. But how practical are they really? Can people in our world today really live like that? If we are truly going to love everyone, even our enemies, and turn the other cheek, well, then it seems like we should call home all of our soldiers, put away all of our nation's weapons that defend our country, and then, well, just, I guess, hope for the best. This is the way some would have us understand this text. The Quakers, the Mennonites, and other pacifists are quick to point out this passage to try to show us that it is wrong to defend ourselves, it's wrong to serve in the military, it's unpleasing to God to ever go to war or to defend yourself. But I assure you, such an understanding of this passage is seriously mistaken. Our Roman Catholic friends read this passage and they say, nobody in life can really live this way to love your enemy, and to turn the other cheek. Surely, these are commands of God that are for people who are only want to go above and beyond the call of duty. And if you really want to live like this, then you need to go into a nunnery or a monastery. That's what Jesus is teaching here. He's giving us lessons on how to live together in a monastery. Well, that understanding is seriously misguided as well. For in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is not talking about politics. He's not talking about political policy. He's not talking about international relations on a global scale. He's not talking about either forsaking the world and going into a room all by yourself or a building with other monks to live your life. Jesus did not think that way. He did not teach that way. In our text for today and throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is talking about your personal life. He's talking about the normal people you meet every day, your family, your co-workers, your customers, your classmates. And it's not that Jesus did not care about the international political scene. Jesus cares about every aspect of life. But when he sat down to teach the people, he addressed them where they lived. He talked about their personal trials and challenges of daily life because that's the kind of teacher he was. He talked about their challenges and their trials and their living from day to day because he was concerned about that. In our passage for today, Jesus is warning them and us against the way of the world. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Well, that's the way of the world. If someone hits you, you hit them back. If someone hates you, you hate them back. If someone cheats you, you get revenge. That's the way of the world. You give people just what they deserve. Now, I have to admit, there is something about that approach that is certainly fair and just. But in spite of that, Jesus says, no, no. You will not solve anything in life that way. You will only bring onto yourself and into the world more anger, more hatred, and more violence. That's not the way for those who follow Jesus Christ. Followers of Jesus take the higher road. Maybe someone is treating you unfairly. Maybe someone is robbing you of the respect and recognition you deserve. Maybe someone is critical of you and sucking all the joy out of your life. And you have every right in the world to be angry. You have every right to get even. But Jesus says, no, don't do that. Take the high road. And why? Why should we take the high road? We take the high road as Christians because that's the road Jesus walked. Because Jesus knows only kindness and generosity can overcome anger and resentment. Only peace and gentleness can ever defeat wrath and bitterness. Only love can conquer hate. 
We are freed from the mind-enslaving attitude of retribution and retaliation because Jesus died for us and rose again. He lives for us and, just as importantly, he lives in us. It is his Holy Spirit that came to us in our baptism. It is his Holy Spirit that lives in us to guide us and strengthen us to make godly decisions about how we're going to treat that coworker who irritates us, that neighbor who infuriates us, and even that family member who just can't seem to get things right. Forgiveness and love, kindness and compassion and gentleness are not only listed as the fruits of the Spirit by St. Paul, but they are also seen in the way Jesus lived his life, and they are part of the Christian's life as well because we are followers of Jesus, and we have his Holy Spirit living in us. That's what it means to be a Christian. Never let any Christian say, well, living like that... Being kind and gentle and loving and forgiving, that might be okay for Jesus. But that's not okay for me. No. That kind of thinking is seriously misguided. Because if you call yourself a Christian, that means you are calling yourself a follower of Christ. And to be a follower of Christ means you accept his ways and his values and his teachings. They are just as important for you as they were for him. With his Holy Spirit in us, we not only love our neighbor, but we also love our enemies. We pray for those who spitefully would use us and persecute us. Now, when we pray for our enemies, we do not pray that they would succeed in their evil intentions, but we pray that the Lord will open their eyes to see the error of their ways. We ask that the Lord would soften their hearts and fill those hearts with his love and joy and peace. Recall that even as our Lord was dying on the cross, he prayed for those who crucified him, saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And if Jesus can pray for those who nailed him to the cross, then surely you and I, who are his followers, can pray for those who wrong us each and every day. We can pray for those who wrong us because in spite of the way they have treated us, we still have their best interest in mind. We still love them and we still care for them because that is who we are. We are loving and caring people because the Spirit of Jesus lives in us. And even as tempting as it might be, it is contrary to the Christian lifestyle to harbor bitter feelings of resentment and anger toward anyone. Now I know some of you are probably thinking, Pastor, you just don't understand. You just don't know the people that I have to deal with. They are making my life miserable. They do not deserve my patience. I have been patient enough with some of these folks. They do not deserve my kindness. They do not deserve my love. And they certainly do not deserve for me to be praying for them. And there I would agree with you. I would agree 100%. They don't deserve for you to do anything for them. But what they deserve is not the point. You don't live a Christian life and practice these Christian virtues because the people in your life deserve it. But rather, you live a Christian life and practice such Christian virtues as love and forgiveness and kindness and patience because that is simply the kind of person you are. God made you that kind of person when he poured his undeserved love and kindness into your life. There's a beautiful example of this in the Old Testament, in the book of Hosea. The Old Testament prophet Hosea married a young lady named Gomer, a woman who really did not have the best reputation. And after a time, Gomer, sure enough, proved to be unfaithful. And her situation in life went from bad to worse so that she eventually ended up as someone's slave. 
Now Hosea had every right to turn his back on her, but he didn't. With the Lord's encouragement, he remained a faithful husband. Hosea chapter 3 reads, The Lord said to me, Go and show your love to your wife again, even though she is loved by another man, even though she is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves Israelites, even though they have turned to other gods. And so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about 10 bushels of barley. Note. Note well that Gomer had done nothing to earn her husband's kindness. Quite to the contrary, she did everything to earn his wrath. But Hosea, whose name means salvation, loved her consistently and saved her and redeemed her from a life of slavery when he purchased her with his own money. Here we have such a beautiful example of the great undeserved love Jesus has for each one of us. Note the amount Hosea paid for Gomer, 15 shekels of silver and 10 bushels of barley. Altogether, the payment totaled 30 shekels, just as Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. 30 shekels of silver was the cost of a slave in ancient Israel, and Jesus was sold as a slave to free you and me from the slavery of sin. Such was his great love for us in spite of our unworthiness. Like Gomer in her relationship with Hosea, we too have been unfaithful in our relationship to the Lord. We have sinned against God, and like Gomer, we too deserve nothing but wrath. But God treats us just like Hosea treated his wife. Instead of rejecting us, he comes to us in Jesus with love and salvation. So we see from Scripture, Jesus loves you with an endless love. You may even turn your back on him and forsake him like Gomer did to Hosea. But Jesus will never ever stop loving you. Just as the waiting father never stopped loving his prodigal son no matter how long he was gone, no matter how far the prodigal son traveled away, the waiting father always, always loved his boy. And so God always loves you. He has given you his undeserved love, and that is why you can give that same undeserved love to others. Because God loves us in Christ, he forgives us. Therefore, we are empowered to forgive others. Because God loves us in Christ, he is patient with us. Therefore, we are empowered to be patient with others. Because God loves us in Christ, he is good and kind to us. Therefore, we are empowered to be good and kind to others. This is how God expresses his love toward us, through his forgiveness, his patience, his kindness and mercy. And this is how we can express our love for others each and every day, wherever we may be, whether it's in this congregation or in our community or in our workplace or in our school or down at the Lutheran Student Center. This is why the Lutheran Student Center is there to share that undeserved love with the students there at the university. It's a pleasure for me to be here today to thank you for your help. I appreciate very much your financial support that you have been so faithfully giving us. And because the Lutheran Student Center is there, it is a place where students can gather for birthday parties, graduation celebrations, Saturday night dinners, and while they are there, they will be reminded that they have a Savior in Christ Jesus who loves them so much that he died on the cross for them and rose from the dead so that he could redeem them and live with them and in them and bless them with an undeserved love. Why? So that they, in turn, can go out and share that same love with others. Thank you for all that you have done for us. Please keep your support coming, and please remember us in your prayers. And may we continue to work together 
to share the undeserved love of Jesus at the Lutheran Student Center and every day in our lives wherever we may travel because the world needs the love of Jesus as much as ever before. And it is my prayer that they might experience that undeserved love through me and through you every day. In Jesus' name, amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, stand guard over your hearts and minds and keep us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.